Good morning. While you're chilling out, you can turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1. That's where we're going to be looking today. So if you want to do that while I'm talking, you can turn there. And I just add my welcome to John's. If you're a first-time guest with us, you are so welcome. We're so happy that you're here. Let us know if you need anything. Thanks for coming, and we're glad to see your faces this morning. Um, we're going to do part two of our Chasing Love, Sex and Relationships in the Land of Confusion. Did I get it right? Okay. In the land of confusion. Got it. All right. So we're talking about sex today. So let's just do a little exercise because as soon as I said sex, everybody kind of squinched up like this. So just kind of shake it off. It's okay. Just shake it off. It's not going to be bad. I promise. It's going to be really good. So just kind of shake off that, those nervous feelings. Let's get going. Okay. So, and last week, Pastor Kevin sang and he had a cowboy hat on. I don't have a hat today, but I'm going to sing for you if that's okay. Okay. All right. This is a song about love. I gotta take a little time, a little time to think things over. Now this mountain I must climb feels like a world upon my shoulder. Through the clouds I see love shine It keeps me warm as life grows colder In my life There's been heartache and pain And I don't know If I can face it again I can't stop now I traveled so far to change this lonely life. I want to know what love is. That's my boy. Do the show. was good. Jacinda's my favorite singer, and actually, what you don't know is that she's actually something of a country music star, and so uh, someday we're going to have to let the full uh, country music Jacinta come out, and then we'll be, uh, it'll, be all, it'll be all good in the hood. Listen, uh, we also have a lot of people joining us online today. We're all over this room, could we just help welcome those that are joining us online today? We're so glad that you're here. And uh, excited about what God is going to say to us today. Jacinta mentioned Genesis chapter one. That's where we're gonna read. So it's on page one, and it'll be really easy for you to get there on your blue Bibles. There are blue Bibles underneath your chair, by the way, if you'd like to join us there. And I'm gonna read verses 26 through 28. And I just remembered in the, uh, in the live stream service, I try to roam as little as possible, and so... Richie, I'm going to stay in this area, I promise, I'll make it easy for you, okay? So Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 28, and then we'll drop down and, and uh, read verse 31 as well. Here's what we read. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heaven and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his, own, in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it 
and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heaven and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Dropping down to verse 31. And God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you've gathered us in this morning. People coming from all different directions, people coming from all different backgrounds, people coming here, Lord, from all different faith levels and levels of understanding about faith. And the awesome thing is that you have something to say to all of us. And so God, I pray that you would speak to us today, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. God, you are my rock and my redeemer. I pray that you speak to us today in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. And we didn't have Broad River News today, so I think I need to try to say this thing that I haven't said in a long time, which is, tenemos traductores al español disponibles. Si usted necesita uno, necesita uno, por favor, levante su mano. Okay, so if you'd like to have that, it's available. Listen, don't clap when, when I do something awful, please don't clap, okay? That was, that was horrible, okay? But I, but I did it, and, uh, and so we're there. So listen, I was, uh, I was watching a, a show a few months back about the oldest man-made structures in the world. Now, I get really geeked out about ancient stuff, and so as I was watching, I, re I remembered a place that Jacinta and I got to visit in Ireland. It's a place called Newgrange, and it's a, a burial tomb that's supposed to be over 5,000 years old, and it was incredible to be there down inside this tomb, this little, one little shaft of light coming into where the altar was there, and as I was standing there inside that tomb, I had a thought that I think many of you might have had if you were there, which is to say, what, what could be older than this, or maybe the thought that I had that day, maybe you wouldn't have this exact thought, but it came to my mind is, what can people create that really lasts, like this thing, right? The, the Egyptian pyramids come to mind. Machu Picchu might come to mind. Who knows what it is for you? But I, I want you to consider another question today that's similar, and that is, can humans create anything that lasts forever? I told you, last week that I'm, I'm thinking in this series a lot about Generation Z, uh, and this is a good question for you, especially if you're in the ages of 11 to 25, but it's for everybody today. Can humans create anything that lasts forever? And I think that your initial response when I say that might be to quickly respond, well, no, right? Everything eventually disintegrates, right? I think it's, the, it's this, like the second law of thermodynamics. It's, it's the law of entropy, right? It's everything physical is going to cease to exist at some point, right? But I, I want to push back on that answer as we talk about sex in the land of confusion, I wanna disagree and say that actually, with God's power, humans can make something that lasts forever, and that is other human beings. We've only got a few minutes today, so I can't go too deep into this idea, but the Bible says very clearly that humans are not just bodies. So get this, you are not synonymous with just your body. God made us as humans as both body and what else? as soul, right? So yeah, physical things are going to cease to exist. That's your body, right? But, but every person also has a soul that will never cease to exist, that will be joined to your new body in the resurrection. Now listen, that's, what this, that's not what this sermon is, sermon is about today, but you need to know that's what the Christian church, what I just said about your body and soul, that's what the Christian church believes, that's what this church believes, that's what I personally believe. Get this, a trillion, trillion, trillion years from now, you will have as much time left as you do today. That's why I love what this professor named Jeremy Pettit said about Sex. He said, sex is the most powerful creative act in the universe. When a man and woman come together in sexual relationship, the possibility of creating an eternal soul or spirit arises. 
At the moment of conception, a new immortal soul or spirit has entered into eternity. I want you to leave that part up there just for a minute. Let that sink in. Make sure you don't miss that. God has created human beings with the capacity to create something that lasts forever. C.S. Lewis, the Christian philosopher and theologian, wrote once that there, he wrote once that there are, he said, there are no ordinary people. He said, as you've been going about your day, you have never talked to a mere mortal. Right, so nations are mortal, uh, civilizations are mortal, but the people that you live with, the people that you tell jokes to, the people that you go to work with, the people that you marry, they aren't normal. Now somebody just said, I know that about you to the person that they marry. They aren't normal, right? Not because you think they're weird. Why aren't they normal? They are immortal. Okay, Pastor Kevin, why, why, are you, why are you philosophizing on us this morning, right? Not everybody went to college and got a philosophy degree like you did, dummy, right? But I, I, what I'm trying to just set up here is, is where we're gonna end today because listen to this, sex is not a throwaway. Sex is not nothing. Sex is powerful and it is sacred. And hear me, it matters. I said this series is about love in a land of confusion. So I want you to get this. This is why this enemy, the Bible calls him Satan. This is why this enemy is hyper-focused on twisting God's design for sex. I want you to see this twist. Get this twist. Sex brings new life into the world, but John chapter eight, verse 44, says that Satan is a murderer. You need, you need to see this twist. Children, watch this, are a blessing from the Lord that bring hope for the future, but Satan wants people to be filled with despair. Everybody know this. We have an enemy, God's enemy actually, that is opposed to every good thing that God wants to do. And so that enemy has spent and focused a lot of effort on destroying the goodness and the beauty of sex. Let me, let, me, let me do this real quick to show you. Genesis chapter one, we learn as we read this whole chapter, we just read a good portion of it, that, that uh, water and land are good. God's creation is good. This is what we see in Genesis chapter one, right? Water and land are good, plants are good, animals are good. Then God makes human beings and gives them a command to populate. In fact, put verse 28 back up there, please. So I think that based on reading the entire chapter, we can make the assumption that sex is good. So why does our church have an optimistic view of the world because we believe that God made a good world so people can populate it and live in a loving relationship with him and with other people. But then in Genesis chapter three, the enemy shows up and goes to work. We saw this last week, undermining God's plan for the world. Right? He gets the first humans to question God's character. How does he do that? First, I want you to see this. First of all, if you're taking notes, there's three things that you can write down here that I think would be helpful to you as you think back on them. First of all, Satan corrupts. Satan corrupts. He takes what God has made good and he corrupts it. So you take this glass of clean drinking water. Some of you that are a little thirsty right now, you say, that looks good. I'm going to drink that, right? And then you dump a little bit of this in it. Well, that was more dirt. It was more leaves than it was mud. My first sample. Oh, there we go. And it's not, this, this is the word corrupts. Right? This is the word corrupts. The scripture says the enemy is also known as the father of lies, right? He lies about everything. He corrupts God's good plan. So just for example, the purpose, the purpose of food is what, right? Purpose of food is like nourishment and, and pleasure. But the enemy says, no, 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 no. You should eat more than you need to eat. The Bible calls it gluttony. Or, or here's the other twist, right? You should eat less than you need to eat, 
right? We have anorexia and all of these other things, right? Work, watch this, work is a good thing, but the enemy says, that, no, 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 you don't need to work, we call it laziness. Or the enemy says, no, instead, you should work. In fact, you should find your very identity in work, right? This is called workaholism. Are you seeing this? The enemy corrupts the same thing with love, sex, and relationships, right? Marriage is, is corrupted by the enemy encouraging divorce. You have natural human desires. Listen, these human desires that are natural in you, but the enemy corrupts it, right, through pornography and so many other things. He corrupts God's design for humans from the beginning by questioning and undermining the objective reality of male and female. Satan is a corrupter of God good, God's good plan. Secondly, Satan deceives. Did you notice last week that he doesn't directly tell Adam and Eve that God isn't good? He doesn't do that. That's not smart, right? He doesn't say that. No, he, what does he do? He just very subtly asks questions to get them to lose confidence in God's character. You need to get, when you think about your enemy, you have to get this idea out of your head about some scary looking guy in a red suit carrying a, a pitchfork, okay? That, that, I, that's not sneaky. <laughs> That's not really even very scary, to be honest. Listen, I was never scared that my kids were going to become Satanists, right? It never really even entered my mind. But what am I concerned about with my kids? That they would be, I'm concerned that some of you sitting in this room here today would just be subtly influenced with these ideas that are constantly coming at you through movies and music and social media and your friends. Listen to me this morning. Satan is a subtle deceiver. He'll try to convince you when you make a wrong choice, listen, that you're actually making the right choice. That's why we don't determine if God's word is right by our feelings. We determine if our feelings are right by God's word. Amen. You can say amen there. That's important. <laughs> Satan corrupts. Satan deceives. Third, Satan twists. Look at Genesis chapter three, verse one. Actually, right in the middle of the verse is where you want it to be. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Subtle. Our enemy will twist God's word. That's what's still going on right now. Sneaky. That's why I started with this idea of humans as eternal beings. You need to see this. Watch, watch how this works, this, this twisting. Sex matters deeply because it has the potential of creating an eternal being. In fact, I just can't help but notice uh, because we're seeing her for the first time in church today that we have a brand new baby Collins that's here with us today. Why don't you stand up and, and show baby Collins off here. And I know her name, but it's slipping my mind right now. Sydney, yes, yeah, Sydney. We're glad that Sydney is in church today, right? And Monica and, and Chris too. We're glad that you're here too, right? Sex matters deeply because it has the potential of creating an eternal being. Sex is a big deal. But watch how Satan will twist this. This is how it's going down in our culture right now. Satan uses memes. Satan uses TV and social media and movies to make it seem like, watch this, sex is actually the biggest deal. We are part of this sexual revolution that started about 50 years ago now. In fact, I, I, I like to call it a sexual devolution, right? Because it's devolving. What, what did the sexual revolution say? It said a lot of things, but at its core, the sexual revolution said this, hey, sex is the way, everybody say the way. Sex is the way to happiness, and hear me, that's a lie. It's a twist. Listen to me, if you get this, you'll get a lot right now, okay? Sex is good, it's a gift from God, but it is not the best of what we get to experience as humans. Somebody's gonna get set free this morning. I'm so excited about what God's gonna do over the next few minutes. Let me just show you an example of a twist. Satan has convinced a lot of believers along the way, including some believers that are sitting in this room today, that whatever they did sexually, 
And I, I told you last week that I'm not filling in the blanks in this series. I told you why I'm not filling in the blanks because as a culture, we have devolved to a place in our dialogue that we can't even listen to the questions most of the time, much less stick around for the answers. So I am not filling in the blanks today on purpose. I'm focused on a higher level, but you can fill in these blanks. He will convince believers that whatever they did sexually, convince them that it's the worst sin, and because they did that, they are damaged goods, and they're not going to get God's best for their life, and I want you to hear that this morning, that that also is a lie. Yeah, it's good to clap for that. It's good to clap for that. It's a lie. The, 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 the early church leader was writing, I love this, to a group of people in a church that had done a whole lot of things that were outside of God's plan for sex. And I, I want you to see how Paul describes these people. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11. He said, and such were some of you. Now that's a shouting point right now because were is a past tense word, right? And such were some of you, watch this, but you were washed. Somebody say washed. You were sanctified, say sanctified. This word means made holy. Who, me? Yes, God is making you holy. You were justified. It means made right in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of our God, washed, sanctified, justified, amen? Get, sexual sin is serious. It's serious, but it's not the worst sin and it can be forgiven. So as I'm talking to you and the enemy right here in this moment will start bombarding your mind and telling you that you can't hear this and that you can't receive this and you can't move on past what you experience. If you start to experience the pain of your past, I want you to remember this morning that God forgives you when you ask him. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 says, if you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive you your sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. I want to focus today on what sex is for over the next few minutes. What is it for? And then end with some myths about sex. My wife and kids make fun of me. I don't have my phone. I don't need it. It's okay. My wife and kids make fun of me. Let's just leave it there, right? <laughs> I was going to move on. It's like, there's really no need to move on. We'll just stop right there. And so at later, somebody of you could pray for me. It'd be great. But no, they make fun of me actually, because um, I text with one thumb. Somebody back here said, no, <laughs> like I did now somebody in my family had passed away or something right now. I, I can do it pretty fast actually, but just one thumb and my thumb's of course too big for the keyboard. So I make lots of mistakes and I have to go back. Any other thumb, one thumb texters out there today? Come on. Yes. Yes. Come on. Good people. Good people. Yes. Hallelujah. This got spirit in this place right now. Okay. I, now, I'm told that's not how it's supposed to work. I know that Gen, Gen Z's like to make fun of baby boomers especially, but even Xers like me, like we don't really know how things are supposed to work. And listen, that's exactly what I'm trying to do in this short time as we talk about sex. I want all of you to live free. I want you to know God's truth because it will set you free. And there are two types of freedom. There is freedom from, right? This is escaping. This is the ability to make any choice without anything or anyone holding you back. That's freedom from. But watch this. There's also freedom for. And this is about being able to use something according to its purpose. So we know how the enemy wants to twist and deceive. But what is sex for? God is the creator creator of sex, and he says there are three primary purposes for sex. Write these down quickly. First of all, sex is... Hopefully no one is surprised today that sex is about babies. We read it. Be fruitful, multiply, fill up the earth. This is a blessing. It's also, by the way, a command. It's, by, it's a command that I usually don't hear many complaints about, but watch this, watch this. A sex between a man and a woman, you have to hear this right now because I'm gonna say something that's nuanced, so lean in, don't miss this. Sex between a man and a woman is a procreative act even if a child does not result. This is important. 
We have people in our room, in our community, that have not have tried to have children and have not been able to have children no matter how hard they've tried and, and they aren't able to have kids. But listen, when they are sexually active, they are still coming together in a way that is procreation. Are you with me so far? Get this, procreation is an indispensable part of God's design for sex. Sex between a man and a woman is oriented toward the procreation of new life, even if that's not the outcome that happens. Sex is for procreation. Another purpose of sex is unity. Sex bonds people together. Don't miss this because you're going to need it in a minute. Genesis chapter 2 Verses 20, verse 24 says this, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife. Watch this, they shall become one flesh. When a couple has sex, something changes in their relationship. There is this unity that happens. Watch this, it's not, it's not just physical, it's not just biochemical, it's both of those things, which is one of the main reasons that teenagers have a hard time breaking up after they become sexually active because it's physical, it's biochemical. It's not even just spiritual, and it is that, but it's emotional and it's relational. Has anybody here ever heard of oxytocin? You know what oxytocin is, right? It's this hormone that occurs in both sexes, but especially women in higher levels. It's released during sex, and watch this. Oxytocin creates this bonding and trust with another person. Science confirms that this bonding takes place on a neurochemical level. It happens a lot of times, especially for women, like when intimate physical touch happens or during sexual activity. You need to hear this. Oxytocin helps build trust that you need for a lasting, healthy relationship. This is part of the reason that sexual activity with multiple partners raises the risk of emotional, significant consequences later in life. Especially for young women, but also for everyone. Some of you are trying to check out because of where you are in life right now. I want everybody to say, this is about everyone. Come on, say it. This is about everyone. God has designed sex to help bond a man and his wife together for life. Well, pastor, isn't sex about pleasure? Of course it is. God designed it that way. God could have made it boring. He could have made sex like taking out the trash. But he didn't, right? Instead, he makes it one of the most exhilarating experiences humans can have. It's a gift for us. But there are other things that bring us pleasure too, right? There's other things. Anybody ever get any pleasure out of eating? Right? Anybody ever get any pleasure out of exercising? Right? Anybody ever get any pleasure out of, I don't know, reading a good book? Now watch this. What's the purpose for eating? The purpose of eating is to get some nutrients for survival, right? And when we eat just for pleasure, it can lead to some pretty bad consequences, right? I once ate an entire cheesecake in one sitting. <laughs> Listen, y'all, 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 I'm not talking about the little junior's cheesecake station. I'm talking about the entire cheesecake with a half gallon of whole milk, okay? Watch this. There are a lot of things that feel good that aren't right for us. Sexual activity outside of marriage can and often does feel good, but that doesn't make it right. That doesn't make it good. That was all under the purpose of, 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 of sex for the purpose of unity. I got a little off the trail here. The third purpose of sex is it, it gives us, I love this, sex gives us a preview of heaven. The apostle named Paul said it this way in Ephesians chapter five, verse 30. It's gonna sound familiar to you in just a second. He says, verse 30, because we are members of his body, and listen to this. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Do you remember that? We just read it. It's a quote from Genesis. Marriage has existed since creation to point us to what it looks like for Christ to come together with his church. 
And when we come together in the sexual act, it's like a glimpse. It's a really light glimpse, but it's a glimpse of how we will be together with God forever. I don't want anybody in this room today to miss the bigger thing that's going on in sex. There is a deeper unity. There's a deeper connection that happens when two people come together in this way. Our culture is confused. Sex is everywhere, in the music, in the movies, all over social media, and our culture has lost the higher purpose and meaning of sex. Here's why we're confused. So many people think that sex itself is the road to happiness. So instead of worshiping the creator of sex, people instead end up worshiping the created thing. By the way, the Bible calls this idolatry. The Bible calls this worshiping idols. When I lived in New Mexico, uh, I wanted to go to the Grand Canyon. Back in the day when I lived in New Mexico, if you wanted to take a trip like this, you'd have to buy this thing called a map. <laughs> An artifact of the past here, okay? It's made out of paper and it shows you all the roads and tells you how to get there. So from my house in Albuquerque, if I wanted to get there, I'm gonna have to take I-40 west, and at some point I'm gonna have to jump up on I-89 north. Now, imagine that I bought this map with Rex. Sarah, I want you to help me today. Just stand, stand, stand right there and hold the map facing me. Imagine that I, I bought this, this map with directions, and I put that map in a frame, and I put it up on the wall, and I never actually went to the Grand Canyon. So instead, every morning, I would get up, and I, I would go down, and I would drink some coffee, and I would just look at the map, just thinking about how glorious a trip to the Grand Canyon would be, but I never actually intended to go. Stay there, stay there. This right here is exactly how people treat sex. This map, the gift of sex, like all of God's gifts, is meant to point to the giver. It's the creator, and it's just a taste of what God wants to give us. It's like a road map to some amazing definition, but get this, the road map is not the point. The destination is the point. Do you see this? All right, give Sarah a hand. She did great, all right? The destination is the point. I wanna beg you, especially some of you who are graduating school and heading off this year, I wanna beg you to not settle for cheap thrills. To not settle for cheap thrills when there is a God who wants to satisfy you for real and give you good things that point you back to him. Amen? This is the land of confusion. Even the best sex life cannot satisfy the craving of your heart for love and connection. Jacinta and I have been married for 27 years. And I thank God for my loving, beautiful wife. But listen, here, here, listen, I thank God for her, but she is not my ultimate fulfillment. And I am not hers. We both know that there is no human relationship, including our marriage, that can fulfill the deepest desires of our hearts for love and relationship, and the same thing is true for many of you. I've often had single friends tell me that they fear by not getting married or, or having sex, they are missing out on something. They're missing out on something good, and I get it, especially with the way that our culture worships sex, but remember that when what we get to feel in sexual union is just a taste of something way better in the future. What we will experience in heaven is far greater. This is why Satan wants to twist the nature of sex. If he can confuse people about sex, he can confuse them about heaven. But if we can understand the purpose of sex, we can be set free to experience love, sex, and relationships as God designed them for us. Let me, let me do this quick. I want to end by three myths about sex. And I have to do this. I've gotten too excited and I'm, I'm way behind. So we're going to do it nice and quick. Let's, myth number one, sex is not a big deal. We're going to do some myths next week on singleness, myths on marriage the final week. Sex is not a big deal. It's a myth. 
We've covered this. I was reading an article a while back about Jennifer Lawrence, who started in a movie called Passengers with Chris Pratt, sci-fi thing, right? And she had never done a sex scene. The movie calls for a sex scene. And so before she goes into the sex scene, she goes and gets as drunk as she can. Right? Just to dull how uncomfortable it was. The, the night before she, the, she filmed the scene, she called her mother and said, Mom, I just need you to tell me that it's going to be okay. Why, why when we interview actors about movies, why don't we ask about the other scenes first? Why do we always ask about the sex scenes first? It's because nobody really believes that sex is just another uh, physical activity. We know it matters. We all know sex is a big deal. That's a myth. Myth number two, sex is just a private act. You ever heard this? Hey, it's just a private act. What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. You've heard that, which actually isn't true. Actually, the ad should say, what happens in Vegas is gonna end up on YouTube the next day, right? That's what it should say. The sexual revolution started this myth that sex is just an, a, a private act between consenting adults. What people do, you hear this all the time, behind closed doors is up to them. What happens in the bedroom stays in the bedroom. And of course, sex is a private act. It needs to stay that way, but it has public consequences. STIs, STDs, 20 million new sexually transmitted infections happen every year in the U.S. This is something that everyone pays for. Children are a consequence. Little Sydney is a consequence, y'all. She's a consequence, right? We already covered this. Sex quite literally affects everyone. Your character is a consequence. Listen, if you're part of Gen Z, I want you to hear me. Your sexual choices and experiences deeply shape your character. It's a big deal. It affects the way that we treat other people. Here's the last one, myth number three. Sexual intercourse is all that matters for purity. In other words, avoiding sexual intercourse. I can't go into this one. I won't based on the makeup of who's in the room today. I know some of you here today might have arrived at this idea that any kind of sexual behavior is okay outside of marriage other than in intercourse. And I just wanna tell you again, this isn't just about your body. Paul said we need to be pure in our bodies, but also in our minds as well. God wants us to be pure in body, soul, and mind. He's not interested in us finding some sort of technical definition of what's okay in order to make it right up to the line of what is acceptable to do in order to find out how to do what we want to do. He wants us to love him and other people with all of ourselves. Jesus came, Jesus came and confirmed God's plan. He came and confirmed God's plan. He said, I didn't come to destroy what came before me. I came to bring it to completion and to feel, fulfill it. Jesus has a plan for your sex life. Well, it's, it's, just, it's just my business, nobody else. Jesus is gonna disagree. Jesus is gonna say, no, I, I actually have a plan. The way that you were created, I want you to live that way. I have a plan. He, he came and he also offered us forgiveness for all of the ways that we fell, fell short. I already covered this, but I want you to know if you're sitting here in this room today, it doesn't matter what you did in the past. Today is a day that you can say, God, I will trust you. Jesus, I will trust that you're playing. Jesus, I understand that you know every gene in my body, every chromosome, every cell of my body. You created me. You know what's best for me. Jesus showed us the way to love God and to love others. He gave us a very clear plan. So we just asked the question, will you trust him? Will you trust him? Will you trust him? Just close your eyes with me wherever you are all over this room. Lord, thank you for speaking to us today. We give you our hearts. We give you our souls. I pray for some people here who have been around the church for a while. And today, this, this question is just reverberating in their mind, reverberating in their mind that you're saying, hey, will you trust me? Will you trust that I have a plan for you? Will you trust that I know what's best for you? Lord, we want to answer that question, yes. I pray that no matter who it is today, and they would say, you know what? I've already been there, done that, already bought the t-shirt. It's too late for me. That that also is a myth, that that also is a lie. That you have sexual freedom and sexual purity in mind for everybody that is in this room today. That you want to set us free. You've got freedom for us. 
<laughs> freedom, Jesus. Thank you for your freedom. But I pray for a few people that have gathered in here today that as I've been speaking, they, they would say, you know what, I, I have to put first things first. I haven't even really made the decision to, to be a follower of Christ, to let Jesus be the ruler and the leader of my life. So as I've been speaking, maybe earlier when we were singing, it could have happened at any time. You just feel something just tugging on your heart to say that, you know what, I need to make a next step. I need to make today a day that I make a decision. I need to make today a day that I said, that's the day that it started for me that's you today, I'm gonna to say a prayer here in just a minute. And I'd love to have the opportunity to pray this prayer for you. I'll say some words, you can repeat them after me, but make them words from your heart. Today, if you're someone that would say, you know what, I wanna to make today, May 16, 2021, the day that I decided to follow Jesus and give him my everything, that there's no turning back and that I want to, him to be the leader and a ruler of my life. If that's you today, nobody's looking around right now, it's just you and God. All over this room, if that's you, I'd love to know who I'm praying for today and with. Would you just lift your hand? Let me know. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, lift your hands if you'd like me to pray this prayer for you today. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. You can put your hands down. Thank you. Broad River Church, we have the awesome opportunity to pray with those who lifted their hands today. Nobody prays alone. Let's pray this together. Say, Lord Jesus, thank you for coming for me. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for your new life and the life that I have in you. And now I give you my heart. Forgive me of my sins. Turn my heart back to you. I want to live for you. I love you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. I mean, God's done something really awesome here in this room over the last few minutes. Can we just give God a praise right now? Just thank him. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, give him a big praise. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You can stand with us today. So glad that you are here. And um, I want to thank you uh, for your faithfulness and the way you financially support.